Hey guys, welcome to the Tetra Health and Performance Podcast. So we have an interesting episode today. We are reviewing one of our, what I like to think is one of our more successful programs we've ever run. Now we've called this the Hybrid Athlete or Build the Athlete Program. And we ran this in the gym for oh, man, quite a few weeks. What was this, 12, 14 weeks, maybe even a touch longer? Yeah, the first block was a, a long block. Um, as you know, all blocks were pretty much longer than usual. So yeah, it was about 14, 15 weeks. Yeah, mate, it was it was such a good program, and, and what we look to do, what we're looking to do today, is to a kind of tell you guys about some of the success and why why we chose what we chose to kind of great get great results. We'll share some of the results from it, and then we'll reverse engineer the program and show you phase one, phase two, phase three, why we picked certain movements, why they elicited the responses we wanted to get them, and um and and why the program's built the way it is. For those that are starting the program on the Train Heroic, this is going to give you kind of every sort of intricate detail you need to know to execute this program the best you can and also get these amazing results that we got with our members. Yeah, well, should we, we'll start with phase one, right? So it. always with the process of our um, program, and it's kind of like looking at everything from a whole, deciding what we want to get from our athletes, our clients um, in the end, and then reverse engineering it from the first place into the second phase, into the third phase with these slight changes between phases. And some of the biggest changes are the exercises that change each phase. But what we actually do is we kind of like, we change the actual outcome that we're looking for. So in the first phase, we're very much trying to drive this kind of energy system training. We're trying to get build up a big base, we call it, build up a big foundation. And the idea there is that what so many people miss out on is, well, what so many people miss out on this because they're worried that like cardio will affect gains. And while cardio with strength training or cardio with hypertrophy gaining can affect in two ways. Number one, it can actually limit the amount of strength hypertrophy you can do because of the fatigue onset from that cardio. Yep. And number number two, it can kind of get in the way of actually the body's stimulus from strength to actually provide building muscle um, from both calories and from kind of what it does inside the body. We won't get too deep into that, but as long as you have that idea, you can understand how one of the biggest mistakes people don't make is they don't have this kind of like, they don't start off their first phases by actually, okay, let's get as fit as physically possible in this first phase. So that in the second and third phase, I can A, not get fatigued from my heart mm. when I'm trying to build muscle and get all the fatigue in the individual muscle that I'm trying to train and be in strength, have the ability to build up tons of strength tolerance without getting too fatigued from the total amount of work that you need to do. So if we build this big base in the first place, while also trying to access like really good movement qualities and still having like the pre-onset of, um, of muscle building, then we can get so much out of the following two phases. That's amazing, right? And imagine if you are trying to work on some hypertrophy or some strength development. If you're having a heart a heart rate fatigue and that's limiting your ability to load more tissue with an extra couple of reps or to go up a couple of kilos, well, we have an issue. We need something we need to address to actually truly chase our goal. So having that really strong, deep aerobic base is is the foundation to hypertrophy and and strength results. Yeah, so also, this doesn't have to traditionally always be just with sit on a bike for X amount of time. It's just honestly stimulating the heart rate into the zones it needs to be. And this can be done through strength drills with a bit of cardio, like traditional cardio in it, mixed in with jumping and bounding. But as long as we're keeping that, that heart rate uh, zone in the zones it needs to be to be developing that aerobic base, we're going to be working on those fitness qualities pretty accurately. Yeah. And like in that first phase as well, we, we call this, um, we, have a, we have a little um, label for this where we call it um, um, increasing capillary density. And that is because... That is because building a lot of muscle is going to require the ability to get a lot of blood into that muscle. And that's where we can create a lot of the damage and um, a lot of the tension that we want to create in the muscle. And that's also how we create space to then put actual new muscle fibers in there. So we call it capillary density because the capillaries are the exact process in which the blood flows from the bloodstream through and into the muscle. And when we kind of do these higher rep ranges, of maybe like 15s to 30s um, rep ranges, what actually happens is we challenge the, body, the, the ability for the body to put blood into the muscle. Therefore, what the body needs to do is it needs to layer down more capillaries. And we set this perfect foundation for later on in the future, then being able to build more muscle with the other um, stimuluses. Another big attribute here, is, as well as working on our aerobic fitness here, is to it's to work on movement quality, to start introducing a bit of variability with movement and start to capture more friendly ranges to the person. So a good goal here is we're trying to get you pretty fit. 
We're trying to work on our movement quality, get the body to feel the best it can. We're trying to work on this, that capillary density, as James was just saying. We're trying to also deload you from any stress that we had in a previous cycle. So if you have just done a big, heavy hypertrophy or a big strength uh, effort, well, this is a great time to do what's called resensitize, to A, the nervous system, and B, the muscular system at the same time. By dropping down the intensity and working on these different qualities, well, we are going to take a step back from strength and, and hypertrophy work to work on these new qualities. And then when we reintroduce them, holy God, holy shit, they're going to be so sensitive to this new stimulus and even be have more potent effects for your new hypertrophy and your new strength development um, efforts in phase two and phase three. Yeah, it's it's really not talked uh, about enough the fact that the, the resensitization of, of of work because when we're deloading, most of the time we're thinking, okay, well, we need to take away that kind of stimulus of fatigue. But the hard thing about hypertrophy is to keep reaching really high amounts of hypertrophy. You have to do more and more and more and more work, and there comes a point where it's so much harder to increase the frequency, the intensity, and the volume from the week before. Where actually studies show that actually taking some time away from the work. Yep, as long as you're doing enough work to maintain the muscle that you've got, when you go back into these kind of like more lower, moderate volumes and intensities, you can gain just as much from there again. So we aim to that next time we go back into hypertrophy again, we capture as much out of it as possible. And then we take some time to resensitize to it to then go, okay, well, we can capture more from doing less work. And then when we get up to them high peaks of work again, we're gaining again. We're not just plateauing. How fantastic is that? Just that integrated effort of your blocks. So this is something to consider too. Like everything has a reason with the programming. Phase one is working on these certain qualities also to kind of potentiate your next effort in phase two and make that more potent and more successful. And guess what phase two does to phase three? The exact same thing. So each phase is going to be a slingshot into the next phase to give you the best results possible to make sure you're going to kick some ass in this program. And um, with that, Mitch briefly touched on it, where we talk about like the ability to create movement again and, and feel like, like we can move really well in our body. Well, we need to spend some time building up coordination, kind of like stability, mobility. And this is the perfect time to do it because it's all well and good if you are someone that plays a sport and you really enjoy your sport or you like to run um, and all these things. Well, we actually need some, um, like we need movement capabilities for that. And there's one of the sad truths about tons of hypertrophy work and tons of strength work is you need to stiffen up to be good at it so to build a, to build muscle tension you have to stiffen up hold a position and really isolate the force into that muscle to get the most out of it anyway and then to do strength work you have to reduce rotations to, to give yourself the maximum ability to move the most amount of weight well say for example you're someone that plays a sport this over time will limit your sport so what we do is our phase ones are literally okay let's get you moving really really well let's give you everything and the cool thing is they all blend in together the, the ability for your capillaries to take in more blood flow is the same thing pretty much as having movement variability in your body so we're, we're like we're working on getting you to move as well as possible and we always come back to that at the beginning of phase one we do it in many different ways but the principle is still there. That's recapture a really quality movement and get you moving as well as possible before we might take some of that away in the next phase in two and three, but then we get a better foundation to work off. And it's the mindset to go in with the program. If you know the intent, well, then you can make more informed decisions with your weight selection and your intensity selection in the program. So if you know like, hey, my goal is to actually work more on my movement quality here to be a little bit less focused on maxing out in every session, well, I, 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 you're going to make a better effort with your results here and you're more improving with your movement quality, better effort with your aerobic work, and this will kind of slingshot you better into the phase two. So that is kind of one of the things that we put into the back of the mind. And the cool thing is the program has been designed to have those constraints where it's going to be really hard for you to stuff it up. So with the elements of how we've broken down the sets and the timings and how you're challenging your reps, it should constrain you and force you to make those lighter weight decisions and kind of the focus more on that energy system efforts and opening up new ranges. One more thing about the kind of the outlay of phase one before we move on as well is it's different qualities of tissue. So whereas like in phase two and three, we're going to work a lot of muscle, even though we are working muscle in this, we're working a lot more of that kind of like tenderness and elastic abilities of the muscle in phase one so that we can reap them performance um, and power and athletic qualities. And then um, one more thing with, um, with phase one is how we actually organize the sessions. Like we start off the session with a ton of mobility work, like mm. more, more mobility work now, but as we go through the stages, the mobility work kind of dwindles off a little bit because we want to captivate the amount of time on spending it on actually building muscle and strength at a later date. 
but now is the perfect time to like, oh, hey, let's spend some more time doing um, the mobility work. That's really facilitate that. And this is cool. You'll be doing almost like a ground up approach here with your mobility drills. Like you'll be playing with some foot drills to get good relative actions at the foot, which will then have better messaging up to the knee and to the hips and to the rib cage and so forth. So it'd be really cool to kind of really pay attention to the details with these positions and try and pay a bit of nuance to the mobility because it will start to feed you more movement into your body, which will hopefully get us feeling the best we have and moving the best we have. Yeah, as with some of the, for example, with some of the actual um, movement exercises, we, we don't just concentrate on um, on the joints here as well. We're concentrating on, concentrating on your ability to take air into the body and like release yourself from the inside out as, and as well as from the outside in. So there will be a nice concentration on how you breathe when you do exercises because breath being such an amazing tool to either re- restore a muscle or downregulate a muscle. Like so many people will talk about um, tight low backs. Well, we've got some incredible warm-up movements in this where you just segmentally roll on the low back as you have these kind of passive breaths. And what that does is it actually puts the back in a state of actually being able to release and calm down ready to then go into exercises where you can facilitate more quad, you can facilitate more bum and oh, hamstring yes. work because the low back's not being the limiter or not getting overloaded. The cool thing is those movements are designed to be more matched to that day's tasks. So the reason why you're doing those sort of mobility drills on that day is to elicit your body to have as much variability as it can to execute, execute those movements of the day. So it's really cool. Like you will have quite a few drills you play with. Try and match them to the day's task. But these are great tools that you can just put in your toolbox for later on when you tackle your own type of strength training to kind of free up your body to feel the best it can. Yeah, and then from there on, we have um, we take we make the use of a, a circuit. And circuits have incredible use, sometimes overused. And you'll see like the difference in the structure. In the first phase, you'll see like bigger circuits. In the second phase, like more like super seti. And in the third phase, when we're focused on strength, you see like that individual exercise on its own. And then in the first phase, these these are like full body um, uh, circuits. Like, you're going to get four exercises where you're going to hit like legs into upper body, then into a bit more legs, but good, more glute dominant, and then back up into the upper body. But we'll, we'll hit the other part. So we're one. So we kind of kind of think of it like it. It's not how it always works, but it's like a um, quad, chest, back of the legs, bum and hamstrings, and back on the upper body. Big meaty compound drills back to back. Yeah, and these are done for um, a, like a high rep range and at a reasonable speed as well. We're actually oh. we're aiming for 30 seconds of work and in that 30 seconds to get 15 reps. So you want to capture that full range of motion and you're going to work and this is going to, this is going to facilitate a nice like high heart rate, that kind of burn, that kind of endurance effect on the muscles as well. You're honest with yourself. This is this is not a passive session. This is quite challenging. And this was influenced, I think, from our first effort, um, probably Pat Davidson's mass. And that is if that's a mean program, and that's where this has kind of been stemmed from. But these movements are a little bit less strength, a little bit kind of destroy you, meant to be more restorative, but challenging at the same time. So in that 30 second window to find a weight that's challenging enough where you can just complete 15 reps within 30 seconds followed by a 30-second rest and, and repeated on the opposite side, well, that is going to be meaty, meaty work. Yeah, and these these exercises, are, are they're direct. Like the step up, one, one of the exercises here is a, a glute-dominant step up, and it is brutal for the glutes. Mm. And it feels so good after having done it as well because it does deload the back. It really stops you from being able to work the quads too much and really makes that butt work. And the cool thing is, is like the way we've utilized the glute in this exercise and it is in its lengthened position. Which I think no one does anywhere near enough. Too many people are targeting the glutes in their more shortened positions. And this this yeah. allows you to get a, a bigger muscular growth because we know muscles work and build more muscle in their lengthened positions. But also it's very restorative to the body. So while you're building muscle, you're getting this super restoration and you will feel so good going through this. A large emphasis in phase one is more unilateral. So like one limb at a time. And again, this, is, this takes away the ability to be super stiff on two limbs and to create more force. So it also has that slightly more rotation towards it. It's going to be a little bit more movement friendly E, and you'll probably have the ability to move a little bit less load. So it kind of already anchors down your intensity and it's forcing you to move a little bit better by forcing you into these unilateral positions. Yeah, I, I love the kind of the exercise breakdown in these ones and, and the actual amount of work that you have to do mm. with unilaterals. I don't know if you... Um, if you've ever experienced it before, but it's kind of like um, for the listeners, but when you hit one leg straight into the other leg with a short rest, it, it picks up your heart rate hard. Oof. Oof. And then well, once we've done them exercises, and lots of our exercises are very, um, they're pretty not overly used in this block. 
um, for many other people. So you'll, you'll find that we have exercises that most people never ever use and especially don't use them in the way that we do. And these exercises that we've picked up from like all around, all around the world, all different places, all different courses, all, di all, all different information from really highly sought out people who sadly they focus too much on that one exercise and less about how to utilize that exercise in an actual program. It's always a biomechanical lens with the decisions that, that are made in the gym. It's it's a reason to facilitate a certain action in that person's body or a certain like athletic quality that we are trying to develop. It's always a reason with why the movement is selected. And I think maybe you're maybe looking at the same movement I am, James, while we've got the program up. Like a Copenhagen with a glute, like this is a cool movement if you've never done it. Looks a little bit funky, but the reasons for the position are absolutely awesome. And just even getting a sideline. Is, is an awesome underrated used thing. B, to the ability to load the inside of the groin, the adductors and the bleak at the same time and the glute. Holy, where where else is that done? Yeah, and also like the, what that does to your body is it quite often it's going to assist you getting that turn to one side. Mm -hmm. And most people already turn to one side too much, but if we do this on both sides, then we're getting that turn back as well. And we're really facilitating what the pelvis is capable of doing for, for later on. And then um, in that last kind of um, circuit, there's a lot of exercises here, like five exercises, but we're going to run through them. It's going to be like a little bit of bike, a little bit of row, a little bit of run, sometimes a little bit more arm, sometimes a little bit more lower body, but every day is going to have a plyometric. So it's going to have a jump or a plyometric variation. And this is then, this is how we like kind of fine tune the actual tendons and get your body actually moving the way it's supposed to. Research shows very, very well that that's what people lack, especially as they get older as well. And also what most people do in, um, in an athletic population just sadly aren't actually giving themselves anywhere near enough jumps, mm -hmm. which is just the most athletic thing you can possibly do, really. Number one thing for preventing falls, right, is we lose power. We lose that ability to catch ourselves, recollect and redirect forces. And like uh, it's jumping, landing, it's, it's such a fundamental skill to be working on from now and into more mature age. Um, so these these back half of these sessions are broken into like kind of different attributes. So what we're saying is like a lot of the days we more move uh, targeted towards what we call spinal movement. So just moving the spine in different directions. We're flexing it. We're extending it. We're side bending. We're rotating. We're getting movement in the body. So again, I hope you've been listening to it. The goal is not really to be stiff or tight here. We want movement to happen. We're not banging it on. We're just, it's a result of the movement and the movement's um, intent and execution. Yeah, 100%. I'm talking about how getting the glutes to work in their more lengthened positions. Well, we so often see people doing this core work, which is just always restraining what the spine can mm. do. And the spine moves. Like it is, has such an, a great ability to move. And we tend to overly fear what the spine's capable of. And we need to feed that back into the spine. And that, that is the essence of being athletic. Like you don't see many af athletes running along with a rigid spine. You actually see them moving through the spine and everything they do. Just look at someone running 100 meters and see how much they bend over to each leg, how much they get that nice little bit of rotation. Well, we need to be able to resist rotation to some degree, but we need to start off by actually facilitating some rotation. So that's exactly why we have them kind of side bends and forward bends and backward bends in, the, in this block. Rotation is everywhere in the body. All bones twist and rotate. And that's facilitated from everything from your, your upper arms, your legs, your ribs, your pelvis. They all rotate to some degree inwards and outwards. And to make sure that we're facilitating those, those relative movements in those major areas is huge to your movement potential and getting you out of restricted positions and giving you more options to your body. And we're getting you strong and fit at the same time. How cool is that? And we have a good dose of arms as well. Shoulders and arms. That don't forget about them. It's a must have. Yep. <laughs> pretty much in all our programs there's going to be some shoulders and arms as well yeah, like yeah, yeah. You know, you're not going to look super athletic if you don't have a bit of shoulder on you and some and I have to say probably what that, that, that stems from back in the day Joe DeFranco right yeah I think like every athlete or every individual the adherence to any program increases when the shoulders and arms are there and plus just looking good and feel and having a t-shirt that feels firm on the body is an instant boost to the ego <laughs> and that's, 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 a, that's a cool thing look good feel good play good oh damn yes there you go um, anything you want to touch base uh, more on, on uh, phase one? Nope, I'm pretty happy to move into phase two. So I kind of think here, just like think the intensity is pretty low, the volume is pretty high, and the frequency is even higher. The intent is to get you guys fit, to get you guys moving as best you can, and kind of deload you from any intensity that you've been exposed to previously to slingshot you into phase two. Yeah, and phase two now, the, the goal is, whereas we just created the perfect potentiation to build muscle, it's now time to actually do the work and build the muscle. 
And we go through, and we have two different things here. We're like, there's two different ways we kind of consider hypertrophy. One, we call it um, sarcoplasmic. It's where we actually create the space to then layer a muscle. And what we do there, that's definitely what you'd think of the pump. Right? It's the ability to push fluids and fluids and more and more fluids into a muscle. And then that gives you the perfect opportunity to then grow muscles in the new spaces that have been created. And at the same time, we, when we're doing the sarcoplasmic hypertrophy and we're pumping out the muscle, we're also putting all the nutrients and everything in there to then be able to make the muscle and build the muscle from that. So we start off with that a little bit more like, um, so we actually fluctuate a fair bit with this. So one day would be a little bit more of that sarcoplasmic, one day would be a bit more of that myo myofibula is when you actually lay the muscle. So with that in mind, we kind of go through what we call like a, we call it undulated, where we're going to go from one day to another day, a little bit more of a high intensity, low volume day. And then the next day we have a bit more of a low volume, high intensity day. So this is the cool thing about this is that you'll find that high volume and high intensity have different aspects of fatigue. So when I do a really high volume day, I have a, a certain level of kind of more, more structural, more physical fatigue. And that's going to limit me to do that high volume and next day back, back to back. But what, what it won't limit is it won't really limit my neurological outputs, which we'd consider a bit more of a high intensity day. So what we, what we can do here is we can play around with understanding different types of fatigue and make sure that you can always come in and perform at your absolute highest. And this is fun. Just A, to know that we have days where we have to turn up and we have to move some goddamn heavy weight. And then another day that's more designed to be a little bit less intensity and more structurally challenging, putting some muscle on the body, more traditional hypertrophy. So this all undulating effort is, is just up and down throughout the whole week. So you just alternate these days, which would relatively like ideally keep you fresh for the whole week and make sure you're getting recovered A, from your nervous system on one day and then B, recovering from your muscular system the other day. And you'd be so surprised the amount of work and stimulus that you can chuck on your body with this type of pattern. Yeah, and then as well as that, we have, um, we have what we call, uh, we have, well, we have supersets. And with these supersets, we have some um, agonist supersets. So with an agonist superset, you're looking at a muscle group, like for example, the quads, and you're being like, okay, so how can I facilitate the most amount of work done in a quad possible without just putting in junk volume or random fatigue? And the way to do that is to look at the quad as how it can go through these massive amounts of range. And then understanding that when I do a certain exercise, the exercise is only as good as where it can load the range. And quite often what you'll find is like, for example, a squat, the hardest part of the squat is down in the middle bottom. And that's where the quad is mostly lengthened. So what we do is we then say, okay, well, Squat's going to facilitate this nice lengthening of the quad. Now, that's do another exercise that facilitates the more lockout, the top end of the, um, the quad. And because if you can imagine, how easy is, is it to do like a third of a rep or a quarter of a rep at the top of the squat? Because the weight isn't maximal for that. You have to go much heavier to fatigue that out. But what we do is we then put, okay, let's do a knee extension. And that's control the tempo to make sure that knee ex extension is facilitating the shortened range of the quad. And you walk out with like your quads being completely and utterly worked. It's brutal, man. So if you're in the business of putting some muscle on and getting strong, this is for you. And it's um it's nasty here too. Going like squats is gonna obviously be your more primary, your trackable drill, and the knee extension is is just your accessory drill towards the squat. But still, like main effort and main intensity is gonna be focused towards your main movement being the squat. But that um that knee extension, god damn, that's gonna add some spice to it. It's great stuff. Yeah, and like you think of that on the upper body version of that is that you do a bench press and people tend to forget that the bench press is really only loading the length and pec. Mm. So then we go do a cable um, costal pec, a shortened pec, and we wrap the cable around the body a little bit, and then we get the shortened pec as well. And this is facilitating things that most people don't get from their pecs or from their muscles in general. And it's also, um, it's also it's what mobility truly is. It's like the ability to have some strength through full ranges of motion. So we can really uh, even still, we're still trying to facilitate a little bit of mobility through our strength work in this program. I think you just touched on too the sarcoplasmic uh, effect here too with ha like two movements hitting the same muscle group at different length and positions how much blood and stimulus that you're going to be getting to this localized area is going to be massive yeah it's, uh, like it's it's high it's high it's high signal and very low noise it's mm -hmm. like we're really like we're we're allowing the muscle to do the most amount of work and then we're not applying nearly any wasted work so i'm going to say um prior to this superset like your main your main effort here is we still have positional base breathing and some mobility drills to do prior 
also integrated with a bit of cardio. So this will be your warm-up positional base movements tied in with a bit of bike and rower with some decent outputs. And this will be the prerequisite to the actual session itself. And this will be every single day. Challenging stuff. So still working on those aerobic capacity and power outputs as well as some movement quality prior to the session. Yeah, we, we, can't, we can't negate that you've got to get warm before you train and because that's going to allow you to work way harder in the actual strength work. It's in the name, the right? Warm work. up. Yep. And get then that the, temp up. Then you have a second superset after that mm. and the second superset is going to pretty much finish off any other muscles that we feel that we haven't reached from the first two. Mm. So in this case, um, on the squat day, it's a rear foot elevated split squat and a hip extension with a kickback. So we're able to then get that rec fem muscle on the quad that wouldn't have been stimulated by the other two as much. And then we're also able to then get a little bit of um, um, glutes and get the extension and flexion from the hips. Got to touch those calves too at the end. Yeah. Calves still get hit in both their efforts, their soleus and gastro. And so when they're standing and seated type of positions, and you're still getting some core work every single day. Yeah, and I love the use of this. We call this a giant set. It's where we, again, we have like, um, like we did in the first phase. We have one, two, three, four, five exercises and we're rolling between um, a, one day where we do core from front, front back abs, mm. core, side, side abs. And then we have cardio, cardio, plyometric. Keeping the jumps in the background the whole time because so we don't want to lose that athletic um, uh, that athletic quality. We've done, like, uh, continuously keeping jumps in is going to pay you off dividends. And the jumps are just kind of, they're, they're spiced up a little bit now. They're like a, a little bit harder. There's a little bit more resistance. We're aiming to jump higher. We're aiming to jump more frequently. Um, and then the we superset that with, again, some triceps and some arms, like some biceps or front shoulders or triceps and side shoulders. I love the core work that's in here. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Like the intensification of the Copenhagen being more of a static drill in phase one, but now having a more of a dynamic variation of the Copenhagen. We're now doing some more chops and some more rotational type of core work as well. And again, this is kind of still keeping some of those qualities in that previous block to move well and to get some movement in the body. But now it's in the back half of the session and it has a little bit less of a focus. So the main limelight and the main attention is obviously that hypertrophy and strength, but it's not in the completely negated all the hard work we did in phase one. Those qualities are still being kept alive in the background and still trying to keep that movement quality as we start to layer some strength and power on top of it. Yeah, beautiful. And it's kind of like, a, it's kind of this beautiful, like kind of funnel reaction into the final final block, right? Final oh. phase. It's kind of like we've, we have done so much work here and we've slowly layered the work. We've changed the exercises up a couple of times to facilitate what you want to get. And then by now you should have built some decent muscle, right? We've, we've set up the environment. We've set up the work perfectly to build the, the appropriate muscle. It's one thing here for those of the Train Heroic app. This would be a phase. It's, it's built four weeks in the, um, in the app itself. But if hypertrophy is a major development point for yourself and that's like a big driver, Nothing wrong turning this phase a little bit longer and turn it into a six-week phase. This is going to be amazing for putting some hairs on the chest for your strength and hypertrophic development. It's a beautiful phase. I think we ran it for six weeks here at Benchmark when we did it, and I swear to God, every member had amazing, amazing results from this phase. Yeah, but like so, so many people were so happy with the amount of muscle they built. And if you think about it, six weeks isn't a long time um, when it comes to muscle building, and a lot of people are extremely happy with the amount they did put on. Nice. And there's something to note too with all, with all programming. There's, so each, each phase we talked about is that four to six week phase. But in that four to six week phase, there are little changes week to week with the sets, the reps, the rest, the reps in reserve, the intensity, the percentage we're moving at. There are those small fluctuations that kind of help you segue into the, la the next phase. So um, just quickly, we, we send out uh, performance reviews for every single um, block that we do. Mm. So I've got it uh, out, up in front of me now. And when we asked, did you achieve hypertrophy, build muscle in this training cycle, we actually had 50% um, of people say they had a moderate amount of muscle increase, which is, that is, in, that is incredible. Just to notice that over short period, such a short period of time, we had 25% of our members say they achieved a lot of hypertrophy. Damn, baby. And then we had a 10% of members say they achieved a great deal. That's fantastic. Which is, I don't know, like, I do the maths, 50 60, 75, 85% eight, of our members from a moderate amount to a great deal of muscle increase. That's huge. Block. And to think like, and that's, that's over a big pool. That's like over a lot of members. So 
it's pretty impressive. The thing like putting on muscle is not the easiest process as well. Like 5 kg a year is like considered a pretty good amount from a non-anabolic induced effort and just natural with good hard work and training. 5 kg is pretty good. And these members are like getting like similar results in a very small amount of time. Holy shit. And what I do love as well is like it, we know our members pretty well. And um, with, within our membership group, we've got a lot of um, hard gainers as well as some like big, big guys. But the, 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 the issue is there is that hard gainers normally struggle to put on muscle. Mm. And we didn't take into consideration nutrition and diet as much as we could have in this, in this situation. So and with ha- without having control of that, you don't always know what's going to happen. So it seems like we've done, we did pretty well from this program with what they got. And the cool thing is, this is a big point to, to outline as well. With this program, it's not just one type of demographic. It's a very large demographic that we have here at our gym at Benchmark. Oh, yeah. From guys and girls, all different age ranges. Our oldest members been in their 60s and our youngest been in their, in their mid-20s. And we're getting these great results from movement, strength, and, and hypertrophy development from all types of people. So we call this general population, just the general population, just absolutely kicking ass. And it, it's such a, a pleasure to see that the, just the, that extra bit of thought and detail with movement, biomechanics through the program, that success can be everywhere. It does, it's not for one type of person. It's for absolutely everyone. So, totally. Couldn't, couldn't say that any better myself. Um, then the next phase. So this is where we go into what we consider um, strength and power. Yeah. I love the setup of this. Again, like Mitch mentioned, and like the, the way we kind of operate is we're going to have the mobility drills to start off the day every single time. We're not going to take that out, but it is going to become a lesser focus. And the mobility drills are going to tie up into the big main moves. They're going to be more there to set you up for success with that big main move because the setup of the program is very different here. You've got one main movement on its own. You're no longer doing like a superset or a triset or a quad set or a giant set, you were literally just doing that exercise on its own. And we use something that I think is absolutely incredible. It's a cluster set. And the cool thing about cluster sets is they still allow you to capture tons of hypertrophy from your strength work as well. And over three weeks of this, we start off. <laughs> um, and this is, this is tough, right? This is tough. This is 15, 15 sets of three reps. Ooh. Okay. And then the next week, we go into 12 sets of two. And then we go into 10 sets of one. And we're kind of working at percentages here. You might not know your max percentage, but you can gauge it. And the 15 of three, you're going to be working about 80 to 85. The 12 of two, you're going to be working about 90. And then at the 10 of one, you're going to be working at about um, 95%. And these rest periods are pretty small. They're not as forgiving as you might think. So we're in that realm of that 45 to 30 seconds rest and constantly putting these super, uh, these cluster sets back to back. And you might think uh, you might need more rest, but mate, you don't. It is actually sub-maximal, the percentage you're lifting for the reps at hand, which makes it quite achievable to get this amount of volume and intensity in. Oh, oh it really does. And then you've got your main movements. You're like, you're looking at now, we're just going to go back to basics. We're going to go our squat. We've got our bench. We've got a deadlift. We've got a chin. Like, these are the things that you're going to improve. And, wow, well, did we see some good improvement? If I forgot the numbers again on strength, um, we're going to say, what's my strength so what are you finding on that? I'll, I'll kind of give a bit more context yeah, here. Please. So if you look against like to, to phase one to now phase three, the movement's going to look very different. That phase one being like very high volume, unilateral, very rotational driven. Well, now the movements have slowly transitioned to be pretty much all bilateral. And our task as the person training is now we're stiff and we're tired. We're producing force and we're moving big, heavy weight for a lot lower rep ranges. So that is a stark contrast to where we started this program and where has it slowly evolved towards. Um, you'll be, pardon me, you'll Joe, be Joe, doubling Joe. up on a lot of these movements too. So you'll be like squatting and deadlifting and benching twice a week, which is a l- massive increase to, again, where you started this effort. So your exposure to these movements is increasing and so is the intensity and um, volume dropping down massively. So you have large potential to add some kilos to all these major lifts. I've got the numbers up. Beauty. Um, how much um, did your strength improve in the last 12-week training cycle? So this is the big strength part. So this is where we expect to see strength um, increases. We actually saw from our members, I would say I would say, uh, nearly a 100% increase in people's um, PBs of at least one exercise, right? And Which is pre- pretty fantastic. I think most people was all around the board. These numbers are pretty high on this one. It's um, a moderate amount of strength increase was um, 
33.3%. A, a lot of strength increase was a 404 and a great deal was about 15%. So, and then the, the last one, obviously, a few people didn't see, no one, not at all, no one, not at all, just some people would consider it a little. And you find that some people aren't always as happy as just, as you get stronger, the improvements are fewer, sadly. So some people would have only creeped up one dumbbell and strength for maybe a, a few kilos. That, that percentage is absurd, Yeah, right? a great deal, at nearly 15% is pretty incredible. So think of this too, like uh, that percentage is, is over uh, quite a few people here. So something to look at, like I'd say the average attendee on that report would probably be about three sessions a week. And that is amazing results for only three sessions per week to be moving better, to be putting on more muscle and to be PBing with their strength efforts. That's absurd. Absolutely absurd. With the program in Train Heroic, phase one, you have about five sessions per week. Phase two, five still, and then phase three, you drop down to four. So you are going to get that little bit extra stimulus over our average membership base here with that last phase, which means the results and the potential for your results are absolutely amazing. And sky is truly the limit. Yeah. And if we're looking at the exercise that people improve, 87.7% of our memberships improve their bench press. Ooh, that's pretty nice. 70% um, of our members improved um, on their deadlift, 70% uh, on the squats. And then we've got like chin-ups. Um, chin-ups is a hard one for us to measure because we do do a lot of band work. So about 40% of members improved on their chin And that's a big relative strength drill. And the actual the gap from a, a PB on like a squat or a deadlift could actually be a lot harder with a chin-up. Oh, yeah. Well, that's incredible. I think the numbers like, speak for themselves there. Well, that's amazing. I, I'm, <laughs> I'm just kind of reinvigorated again from the program. So good to see that it's done such a great job. And I'm so excited for those of you that are um, joining this journey on Train Heroic and, and training away from the gym to have the exposure with this program to absolutely kick ass and share these similar results. The cool thing with the Train Heroic, every movement's going to have a step-by-step -step guide, a video guide, and also access to us, myself and James, for any questions or feedback to any of the movements whatsoever. So you're never going to get stuck. You've constantly got momentum behind you and be able to share in similar results that we got here within the gym yeah 100 and are we do you reckon we finish with talking about phase three because there's a couple of things yeah like, yeah, yeah more and more on phase three so some of, some of the cool things about phase three is it doesn't leave hypertrophy on the table anymore while it does really really focus on um, strength as the main contributor of the performance we, we now actually still have quite a lot of hypertrophy work so we have some and we have um, a few like kind of niche-ish exercises if you've never tried before, are so worth checking out the program just to try some of these exercises. And the way that we hit shoulders, like with, a, with the, our rear delt rows, you know, other things that just aren't added into program enough is adduction work, actually pulling the, a leg into the other leg, making sure the groin is strong because it's such a big player. Um, even just the way that we, uh, the way we coach and talk about and train hip for us, so different to how so many people do it, and it reaps <laughs> so much more benefit. Um, even things like added, having cable hip extensions or box step ups in this program, I think are like really big bangs for your buck. And I find that this can also take care of a lot of lagging issues in people's movement and strength. And this is what tends to be something that makes us quite different to other people that our exercise selection is on point. And we have a very more varied exercise selection than many other gyms. And we normally use a good principle-based um, idea of why we're going to have an exercise rather than just plugging and playing random exercises. This is what makes us like very good programmers like, compared to some other um, programs that we see where it just seems like, how does that, like I, I read so many programs, I'm just trying to understand someone's thought concepts on it. I'm just like, I just don't understand why you choose these exercises rather than something else sometimes. I think that's such a cool person, uh, such a cool thing. As a consumer, you listening to this potty slash doing this program, you get to know the why behind this and the reasons why this has been designed the way it has been. So you have that higher chance of, or the higher likelihood of buy in and be like, I know why this is happening. I'm going to give 110% to this program so I, I yield the best results possible. Yeah. And we, we really appreciate it and we always kind of empower people to ask why on anything they possibly mm. can. Because I feel like if someone's programming and they don't really have a why behind what they're doing, then they're just plugging and playing or they're just fitting in gaps. And at no point do we ever do that. We start from this big, like, we talk about what we want to achieve. We talk about, um, and if you ever see, like, we always discuss the goals. So, like, each, each phase, we're like, okay, 
So what are our goals for this phase? Um, okay, so let's, let's break it down a little more. So we, we start off when we go, okay, so what are the goals that we want to achieve from the entire program? Yep, then we break it up into separate goals and then we call them the phases. And then each, in each phase, we have a group of goals that we want to achieve for the individual. And then we go down another train, we go methods. Okay, so what methods do we need and know to then achieve these goals? And then along that, once we've got methods, that's when we choose the best exercise to gain the methods to get the goals. And this is what something that isn't done very often from what I've seen in the industry. It's more so that they just choose exercises for the niche and the excitement of the exercise rather than it be the best exercise to get the job done. And sometimes it can be a bit of both. That movement can have a bit of excitement to it, but it has a biomechanical reason. Oh, it doesn't reason. have to not be exciting. Yeah. But I mean, you're going to choose your reps, your sets, your volume, your frequency mm. for a reason to facilitate a certain goal, not just for the sake of being like, hey, just do this. 100%. And, and one of the issues that we see arise with that, you might be just someone who's been told to do like, like way too much work with something and you just won't be reaping the gains because your recovery will detriment your performance increases. And the cool thing is here, you're never going to be spending too much time or overdeveloping one quality. Because everything has a trade-off. Spending one time in one quality can actually take away from another quality. If I spend, say, 90% of my programming time in just a strength phase and constantly working high intensity with uh, low volume, I'm leaving along the table. Imagine all that jump quality and the fitness quality and the movement quality that I am trading off for time spent in strength. Don't get me wrong. If that is your main goal and your main driver, have power to you. That's probably what you need to pick and stick to. Yeah, but even then, quite often, we find that people don't know how to potentiate things mm. properly. So like, why they might be spending so much time just doing strength and they're sticking around on these really hot, um, low rep ranges, really heavy weights. They probably haven't learned how to use velocity-based training or they haven't learned how to yes. use hypertrophy to potentiate their strength better. And that, that's normally the case. I feel like every program should have some sort of, um, some sort of stimulus change or some sort of... Um, uh, a potentiation. The cool thing is here, we're giving you a smorgasbord and all you can eat experience to as many athletic qualities as you can get in this uh, program phase, which is, is what I, 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 I envision good programming doing. It is giving you quality so you can move better, feel better, and perform better for life or on the field or off the field. And that's what training should do. Yeah, 100%. It's cool. Um, I want to, one more thing too with that phase three I wanted to kind of, kind of touch base on. So it's not all it's not all um uh, bloody bloody something roses. I can't think of the, I can't think of the saying. But you do also have some sneaky cardio in there too, some anaerobic work. So they, you got some repeated bike sprints. So um yeah. get used to that. That's gonna be at the back half of the effort after your strength work. So this is this is something just worth touching on too. The way the program is kind of put together here is have minimal interference to whatever the main movement is. So whatever is more important is prioritized at the front of the session. And what is, oh, I don't want to say less important, but whatever we were trying to have less time developing will be more near the back half. So after you've done your big strength and, and stimulus work at the front of the session, well, then we're going to try and capture some energy system work with some anaerobic outputs here. Yeah, I also see it as, you could, it's, um, it's called vertical integration in a sense, is that what we do is we spend the most time and we prioritize at the beginning of the program the thing that we most want to improve in. But hey, in the last phase, we spent some a lot of quality time spent building up some plyometrics or some conditioning. Well, we don't want that to go to waste. So, And to maintain a property is actually much easier than to improve oh, a property. Yes. So if we just want to maintain it so that next phase we can go in and then improve it again, we just keep it in the background burning. We don't give it as much time. We don't give it as much emphasis, but we keep it there so that next time we step into the cardio, we can then get a bigger improvement. You don't use it, you lose it. 100%. 100%. And everything has that trade-off as well, right? Um, any other tips or tricks that you reckon you have for here, Brimmy? Um, no, not really. I just think it's a pretty banging program, and it'd be oh. pretty fun to see people um, utilize it to the best of its ability. There is obviously a um, with the changes change up of exercises and with the different mobility routines that does pay the price of a little bit more attention to detail. But I think that attention to detail is also a big learning curve for some people um, with, with their training styles. Things that we pay attention as you read through, obviously these details, but obviously the structural details as well, like the sets, the reps, um, the reps in reserve, things of that nature. They do chop and change week to week, so pay attention to those small little changes because that will change your experience and your adaptation that you will get out of the program as well. Yeah, that's such a good point. Like you really have to look at the program each week again just to see what has changed. And Mitch just mentioned reps in reserve. That is a big player of how we control intensity. 
So if it's something you've never used before, it's something you should educate yourself on slightly because it is such a game changer. It is probably the most important number to have on a program. I just want to touch on this very lightly too. I won't go too deep into this. Um, we do have other potties that touch on this. But um, you can kind of uh, increase your experience with the program through diet control. So in that first phase, if you are looking for, uh, say, dropping body fat, that first phase, because it isn't as intense and the demands on the body aren't that nuts, it is actually quite a good time to look at a deficit and just being slightly under your normal caloric intake to be working on some dropping some body fat. But in that phase two and three, the demands on the body are a lot higher and the stress is a lot higher on the body. So for hypertrophy and especially with that strength work, if we are looking to get some good um, results here, it's definitely worth to pay attention at your food a little bit more and to be looking at a maintenance, to maybe even a surplus or it would definitely yeah. say a surplus in these two phases. I'd say, yeah, maintenance phase can be there for strength. Like you don't have to eat a ton of food to get much stronger you just have to eat roughly what your body needs to perform hypertrophy if you want to build muscle then you have to have mm -hmm. a surplus and then the first phase you're probably going to like if you are looking for more physique style um, goals then that's going to be a, the perfect phase to be in a slight calorie deficit you can match your nutrition to your programming that's some big brain activity stuff there and your results are just going to be magnified yet again yeah and what's the podcast called for that one Oh, we've got fat loss. Yeah, fat, loss. fat, fat loss. loss would be a good one to listen to because we touched base on uh, a actual um, the calorie deficit, the calorie surplus, and the maintenance phases and when yeah. to have them, how to have them, what They're training there. to do with them. And there's, there's, there's gaining muscle or muscle gain or something of that nature. There's another potty there too if you're looking to, to address your diet in a hypertrophy type of lens. Yeah, and the aim of this whole program is that you should be, by the end of it, stronger and more muscular, you're looking better. God damn, I'm excited. Yeah, it'd be fun. Any closing statements, mate? Nope. All right, my guys, all the best of luck. I look forward to seeing you all guys kick some ass. And those that have done the program, congratulations. We know your results were already fantastic. So great job, everyone. We look forward to we'll talking to you in the next one. Thank you.